Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to talk um, about uh, the role of water in the preservation of archaeological material, um, and that's my title. With some apologies to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, water, water everywhere except where we need it. The crisis of preservation in wetland archaeology. So the sort of outline is a brief introduction to peatlands. Sorry, peatlands and wetlands, or wetlands and specifically peatlands, which is really what I'm talking about. Um, secondly, a bit of background on wetland archaeology. It's really an excuse to show some, show some nice archaeological sites and artefacts. Um, and then what's the problem in terms of the title? What, what, are the, what is the crisis that we're facing and what has it got to do with water? Um, I'm going to give you some examples from the UK and Ireland. And then we're just going to kind of look at a few conclusions from that, really. Um, so a few sites I'm going to mention, so I don't keep having to show maps. I mean, you're probably familiar with these. I'm going to talk about some sites in Ireland. I was going to talk about some um, UK sites, so I'm going to talk about sites in some set levels down there. A few in the, a couple in the East Anglian Fens, and one site from up here from the so-called uh, Humber peatlands. So just for sakes of geographical orientation, um, Ireland, of course, is is largely bog. It's about 18 to 20 percent peatland of of one form or another. So we have a lot of peatland here, and as we'll see in a bit, we have a lot of um, peatland archaeology as well which presents us with various problems, as we will see. Um, again, this isn't really a lecture about, about peatlands as such, but we have different kinds of peatland systems, and we generally split those into fen systems that are fed by groundwater, and bog or mire systems, sometimes called raised bogs, that are fed largely by precipitation. So they obviously have different water chemistries um, and different peat formation as a result of that. So the midland bogs tend to consist largely of, of, of sphagnum peat and the raised bog nutrient poor environments um, and again many actually many fens become bogs later on so the accumulation of peat often leads from a fen to a bog system okay so um this actually is most of the midland bogs are of course heavily extracted for peat for domestic energy supplies so they're drained and extracted and that's generally what they look like under a blue sky which is fairly rare and again this is kind of ironic because obviously we live in you know, generally a very you know, relatively wet country and there's the same view under um, quite heavy rain. So again you'd, you'd be thinking well what is you know what is the problem in terms of water and, and archaeology here. Um, it's often the way with wetland archaeology as the title of the talk suggests that <laughs> the water is not necessarily in the place where you want it to be and often gets in the way of you doing actual work. I always have to show this picture it's a colleague Tom Hill from the UK and I'll try and make a point of getting this picture in whenever I can of him stuck in, stuck in a drain. Um, and then I'll email him later and remind him I've shown the picture. Um, just so that's really... He's the, properly stuck, isn't he? Yeah, he's properly stuck. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, as you can see, I found it extremely amusing. Um, but again, it's the irony of wetland archaeology is the water is indeed often in slightly the wrong place. So that's something we'll come back to. Um, so wetland archaeology. So, so we're talking about... Um, organic material, organic archaeology, most typically um, wood, as we'll see, you can get any kind of organic material preserved in wetlands. Um, some of these sites are you know, quite famous archaeologically and even more broadly famous as well. So you might recognise this is um, uh, Sea Henge here in Norfolk, Bronze Age site, um, discovered some years ago now. Uh, and this is uh, oak wood with an upturned oak stump in the middle of it. So again, organic material. Uh, this is another an kind of iconic site really for archaeologists this is the sweet track from some set levels as i always say to students it's not called the sweet track because it's a sweet track it's called the sweet track because it was discovered by a gentleman named alfred sweet and that's neolithic and that's a date of 3806 to 7 bc so that's the dendro chronology that's quite so accurate this is a famous site in in ireland uh, county longford it's a site of corley one it's an iron age trackway um and again, I mean, the Irish peatlands are full of these kind of wooden structures of, of many different time periods from prehistory through to more recently. Um, obviously, what, something that's often said about wetland archaeology is the fact that we, um, in wetland archaeology, obviously on a dryland site, you get post sockets, you get the kind of shadows of the posts. Um, on wetland sites, uh, you get the actual posts themselves. So that's what we can see here. This is a site we worked on down in, actually, over in Suffolk, this site is. Um, a site called Beckles, um, just not near, near the east coast there. And as you can see, this is this is a post, the top of the post, and that's the post after it's been extracted. So it's a, an oak post. You can see it's been worked to a pencil point there and that. Um, 
but that has a date of 75 BC, spring of 75 BC, so it's a very accurate dendro date. So this is kind of the value of, of, of wetland archaeology is the preservation of um, this organic material that just doesn't really ever or very rarely survives on, on dryland sites. So extremely important. Um, if we look at some Irish examples, we're just losing a bit of the text there. This is, um, this is the site of Clownstown in County Meath. Uh, it's a Mesolithic site. Sorry, I didn't put the date in there. So this is around about 6,000 uh, years old or thereabouts. Um, you can actually see these. This is the fish basket. You can see it in the museum. Um, you can see a picture of it there. So again, remarkable preservation. It doesn't really come through in the conserved, in the conserved item. It looks slightly disappointing, but... Uh, again, these are remarkable artefacts. Another organic material from Clownstown as well, including this older wood um, artefact, possibly a boat, a child's toy boat or something like that. So that's what I argue about what that is. And probably most famously, of course, uh, I suppose within the public consciousness would be, uh, would be bog bodies. So the remains of people, soft flesh remains of people. And again, you, you may have seen these in the, if you've been to the museum in Dublin, the kingship and sacrifice uh, exhibition up there. And this is the face of one very famous bog body. That's the bog body of Tolland Man from Denmark. So these kind of later prehistoric bodies that are preserved in, in peat bogs. So again, we just don't get that preservation really anywhere else, other than, of course, you might be thinking, well, mummies in very dry countries. So there are some other exceptions, but we don't really have a problem with, uh, we don't have an issue with very dry environments in Ireland and preservation for obvious reasons. A link to that as well is not just the big archaeology, there's the other material that's preserved in wetland environments, and that's subfossil remains of pollen, plant remains, insects, tephra, that's volcanic glass. So all these kind of properties that we can use to reconstruct past environments, environmental change through time, everything from vegetation through to climate, also preserved in the peat. So really, you know, peatlands, wetlands are remarkable uh, archives of past people and past landscapes. They're also important in many other ways as well. And that kind of, this graph kind of sums that up. The fact that if you look on the left there, we've got preservation of material in dryland sites, and on the right, preservation of material in wetland sites. And obviously, you can see from that that organic materials such as wood, plant remains, uh, what else we've got there? Skin, bone, shell, antler. Percentage preservation of that kind of material is obviously much higher than on dryland sites. And why is this? Of course, fairly obvious. The reason for this is, is due to the waterlogged environments that we have in, in peatlands. So the accumulation of peat within waterlogged anoxic environments is what leads to the preservation of the peat and the preservation of any organic material that is um, either left in the bog or taken into the bog or constructed in the bog or whatever. So that is the preservation potential. So what is the problem? As we'll see, um, there's a number of them really. Uh, in theory, a lot of these, or at least some of these archaeological sites are protected by a range of kind of illegal instruments. Um, it's, this is not the case that these instruments often work and, and what we're seeing is a significant problem with the preservation of archaeology in many wetland and peatland environments really ac across Europe. Um, this is obviously against the background and it's important to state this is that most policies for archaeology, um, national archaeological policies, stress preservation of remains by in situ. So preserv preservation of remains in the ground where it's all possible. So that's kind of the irony, it's not appreciated by the public is the archaeologists ex actually exist to try and avoid digging stuff up unless we have to. So examples of where we have to is where we preserve things by record. And this is a good example of this. This is the, um, this is the M3 uh, Tara Corridor uh, site. And you can see the footprint for the road. Um, and you can see on the polythene here, we have an excavation going on. This is the um, Liz Mullen Henge, later prehistoric Henge monument. And you can kind of see what's happening is obviously everything in the road footprint, with the plastic is being excavated. The Henge extends out here. That's being left in situ because it's preserved in situ. So that's the main policy is if we can leave archaeology where it is, and um, we leave it, it's preserved in situ. If not, we, we have to excavate it. There's the Henge. So the problem we have here is a number of them, and that is the fact that organic archaeological remains of deposits are extremely vulnerable, not just to direct threats, as in someone digging a hole through them, or peat cutting, as you can see on the left there, where this late prehistoric trackway has been partially cut away. Also, on the right here, 
Um, this is the top of, or kind of top of the archaeology of the site. We'll talk about it in a moment. It's like Flag Fen in, in East England. Um, this is organic archaeology. You can see how dry it is in this hole. And the reason what's happened here, as we'll see in a minute, is the water table is very deep down. So this archaeology is not sat for most of the year within the water table. And that presents a problem in terms of the preservation of that material and its survival over a long term time scale. So this is bringing us back to the fact that you know, water is obviously you know, a really key ingredient when it comes to survival of organic archaeology and the kind of issues we have around that. So I'm going to kind of illustrate that with a couple of case studies. I'm going to begin with, with this. This is the, the Home Fen Post in Cambridge. I don't know if you've ever went over there. So it's just outside Peterborough. And so this is this post. Um, so obviously we're in, we're in the edge of Fenland here, which is obviously a big wetland, peatland area, but heavily drained since uh, you know, the medieval period, if not earlier. Um, so drained for agriculture. And this is a home fen post you can maybe just make out here. This post was driven flush into the ground in the 19th century, in 1848, at the top of the post. And as the peatland is dewatered, you can kind of see, hopefully on here, 1860, 1879, 1992, and obviously the present ground surface in the present day. So the, the peat masses are literally just dewatered as the waters have been drained out of it. This is not because of cutting, it's literally just sunk like a big sponge. So you can kind of see the, the issue here in these peatlands. Um, you don't have to necessarily dig a hole to affect the peat, of course. If you drain the peat, the peat will dewater and collapse in on itself. And that's what's happened here. It's a very kind of graphic illustration of, um, of that process. Is that, is that a constant? Is it a, a constant? Um, or is it, does it change? That changes, so yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. If you look here, that's 1848, that's 1860, 18, that's 1875, there, 92, 70. So, so yeah, um, the process is not oh, necessarily yeah. linear. Yeah. Um, I don't know to what extent that's related to kind of fluctuations in, in flooding and, and other kind of climatic factors. Um, but you know, you can kind of see it's, it's a very graphic yeah, sink, sinking in on itself. Um, and anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute because it. Um, it's, this post is very close to the back flag fan I just mentioned, so we'll return to look at that in a minute. So obviously the important point here is, is the importance of water and, and, and especially a stable water table in most wetland and peatland environments. Uh, obviously biological agents of decay will tend to require oxygen, so whether we're talking about bacteria, aerobic bacteria, but, but um, also anaerobic bacteria as well, which can kind of do operate in anoxic environments, fungi and insects and so forth. And all these processes in the presence of oxygen will obviously have um, deleterious effects on any archaeological material within the peatland. So that, you know, this is one of the problems as peatlands dewater, as the water table goes down, this is going to affect your archaeology, whether or not, as I say, whether or not you're directly digging a, a kind of hole or section through it. So the idea of indirect threats really. So to return to the site, I kind of showed you this case from earlier. This is Beckles again, the Iron Age oak post, you know, beautiful, beautifully preserved. You can see kind of the pencil tip there, you can see the tool mark. Um, I say this is 2,000 years old, spring 75 BC. It's cut down, and so it's, um, it's been or was preserved uh, for, for a long, long time. We can contrast that too. This isn't that. There's that post, the last post, is one we dug up, but this was a post that was a similar post that was discovered. Um, we actually led to the discovery of the site, bank realignment work on the river, on the river Waveney in Suffolk there. And the contractors started pulling posts out, they just thought they were modern posts. So they kind of chucked a few to one side, and, and it was only later on someone looked more closely and went, no, these are not modern. Um, but you can see what's happened there. That post originally looked like, um, looked like that. And obviously what happens is it just dewaters and dries out because what's happening with the wood and as it's actually obviously in the peat is the um, the cells can be filled with water, so what you have with wet preserved wood is it's sometimes referred to as a lignin skeleton, just kind of with cells all filled with water. So the cellulose component um, degrades through time, and the lignin tends to survive preferentially. So obviously, if you then leave it to dry out, it just cracks and splits, and then it's useless like that. You know, so you can't you can't re wet it and restore it at all. Um, and again, there's many other examples of both direct and indirect threats operating. So again, this is some work we were involved in, it was published uh, a couple of years ago. This is a Neolithic, another timber trapway site, uh, from Hackfield Moors, which is another peatland site in East England. 
and you can see the peak cutting here is actually, well, you can see the drainage, the drain through the top. So you've got the effect of drainage, then peak cutting. It's come down onto the track where it has only survived because it's at the bottom of the bog. But you can see the condition this is in. It's partly sampled. That's we dug it. But you can see that both the direct threat has been partly cut away, but also the dewatering um, and degradation of, of the wood through time. So, so again, you know, once you have these sites, we can't preserve them in situ. Really, we have to we have to dig them. That has financial implications. It also leads to arguments about at what point wetland sites are preservable in situ, which is something I'll come back to in a little tick. Um, there's other very famous archaeological sites uh, in the UK that, that are so affected. And this is a site of um, Star Car, which is in Vale of Pickering, um, just, um, just up Scarborough way up there. Um, this is, a, this is a, a kind of classic archaeological site, and it kind of was dug 60 years ago by um, the archaeologist Clark. Um, particularly famous kind of artifact from there is these um, ant deer antlets. You can see this, the, the antlers from the deer. There's, the skull and the two holes that have been bored through the hole there, and it's, there's lots of discussion about what this was for, whether it's for kind of hunting, or only head, or whether it's some kind of ritual um, artifact. But other stuff from there as well, and again, this in particular, the front looks a very kind of famous, iconic image of the site. The problem here is that, as you can see, this is the recent work by the Star Car Project based at the University of York, um, who've been looking at the preservation of the site. And you can see, again, this is the peatland. The peatland's been drained for agriculture, you can see that there. This is some of the archaeology that survives in situ, but you can obviously see here there's no, no flipping water or water tape, but it's well, well down um, here. And to add kind of insult to injury, so the archaeology is not under the water table, and um, the water that is flowing across and through the site is highly acidic, so it's been really acidified by, um, by agriculture. And that's having seriously big impacts on the, um, on the archaeology. Um, so this is from Nicky Milner's work. Um, you can get that title of the paper that, that things aren't great at Starcar. The archaeology is degrading very badly. Um, and again, this is a shot of, a, of some bone that's basically, so it's a mesolithic bone, um, and it's kind of turned into jelly. So this has been, you know, this has been dug up in the recent excavations, and the condition of it is appalling. So what is happening at Starcar is the fact that um, the site is degrading through time. It's even now, as I say, even though this, these are indirect impacts, deep water table, highly acidic environment, the archaeology that remains there is, is being lost. Um, again, there's arguments about the time to go for how long it will be before the archaeology, the organic stuff, has just gone completely. And again, this is a really important um, archaeological site. So we've got direct and indirect threat. Um, and again, obviously, as water tables go down, you, the, the environment changes from, from a reducing one to... To, a, to an oxidizing one. Um, and you can see that very kind of uh, graphically with Star Car. And things have, have, have not been held by uh, local water quality to do with agriculture. So, you know, all sorts of problems and very difficult to know really how to deal with them. And some colleagues of mine did some work on this a bit ago, and it's not just um, the, pre the position of the water table, it's the fact that stable water table is really, really important. Um, so everything, this is a kind of illustration of this, if you have archaeology, organic, below the water table, it will survive quite well. And then they define this zone um, at the top, which is anything that's above the water table that is really degraded, as you can see, so it's, it's well above the water table. Then in the middle, you have this zone that they call zone two, which is where you're getting structural changes, cellular level, shrinkage, and that's where the water table is going up and down. So the fluctuating water table is, is you know, it's kind of it's very bad for the archaeology. It's really anything down here that is going to survive in the long term. Everything else is going to be is going to be lost. So it's the importance of a stable water table. Okay, so a couple more kind of uh, kind of illustrations of this. I mentioned Flag Fen, the, uh, the Home Fen Post. Flag Fen's very nearby. Again, we're right on the edge of Fenland here. So uh, Peterborough. You ever been to Peterborough? Never. Never, yeah. No, you're not, you're I was not, in Cambridge for four years. Oh, right. I never went to Peterborough. You did, yeah, you didn't, you didn't miss much. Much. I probably shouldn't say that on camera. It's a <laughs> lovely place. Um, so Fengate is the Peterborough end, so you can kind of come east into the Fens this way. Um, okay, this is a very famous site. There is actually a visitor centre there, but it's tricky enough to get to. And unless you're in Peterborough, you probably wouldn't go. Um, the site basically uh, has several components, but for our purposes, we'll think about the organic components. And what we have here is, as you can probably pick out, is a a timber alignment that's been built across the embayment of the Fenland in the Bronze Age, obviously when water tables are lower, you know, before sea levels have kicked up and we've got peak forming. 
you've got this very unusual alignment of posts that goes right across the uh, flagpole embayment, and in the middle is an enormous and very poorly understood wooden platform um, that's built. So this is all being built kind of in the Bronze Age, but it carry, carries on through to the Iron Age. There's all sorts of artifacts from the site as well, kind of bronzes and things that seem to have been deposited in the water. And we've got uh, dry lead archaeology at each end as well, so this is kind of part of this big Bronze Age landscape. Um, it was realised after the excavations at the site that water tables were very low um, as we kind of come off Peterborough Island into, into Fen. Um, and the solution to that was when they were building a visitor centre, it was to essentially to attempt to mitigate for that by putting in an artificial mirror or a lake. So that's a visitor centre and the, it sits in this on stilts in a lake. The idea being that the water would kind of percolate downwards and keep the sediments and the peats uh, relatively wet. And keep, does keep the archaeology wet as well. Um, you can actually go and see the archaeology a part of it in, in, in situ in Flag Fen. They have what they call a preservation hall. So it's not a great photo, it's difficult to take a picture because it's dark and wet. But this is the, the archaeology of the alignment. You can see there, they keep it wet with a sprinkler system. Um, but nevertheless, it's kind of falling apart. It's not quite as nice as it used to. Um, but again, that's you know, one solution here is to do that, where you've exposed it in this elsewhere. But the problem is, and there's some work we were involved in a few years ago now, um, and what you're looking at here is, this is the, these, these posts mark the alignment, so these are modern posts. There's the preservation hall you just saw with the archaeology. So what the project was doing was opening test pits to come down onto the uh, Bronze Age archaeology and look at the condition of it. And again, that was a nice summer. And this is what we see. Again, that's the earlier picture. These are the upper silts that seal the peak down here. And you can see it's the top of the archaeology. And again, you, know, you don't need to be an archaeologist to look at that and go, that's really dry. Um, and again, the, archae the water table is, is deep, like that, really deep down. So the archaeology is largely above it. Um, uh, as part of this project, samples are being taken. And again, this is some of the uh, posts, or uh, some wood, archaeological wood from the alignment. And you can see what's happening with these very characteristic uh, radial cracks that you get as, as wood dries out. So this has been lifted out of the peat, but you can see what's happening because of this deep water table and the information is just going. The, the archaeology is, I'm not going to use the term that, that the, the wood specialist used, but you can guess what it was in the vernacular. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's degrading. You know, the, pres the, the chance of it being preserved long term are, you know, really not good. So if we look at Flag Fen, this is kind of a transect across the alignment, if you can see what I'm talking about. So we've got the basal sort of gravels, and then we've got the peats, and this is where the archaeology is in here, different strat, don't need to worry about that. Some of the people at the top has gone anyway because of agriculture and drainage. Um, and there's been, there has been work looking at the water table and monitoring its position using peatsometers. And what that shows is what you can probably guess from the last picture is the fact that the water table is somewhere down here, that's a guess. So it's well... The archaeology, a lot of the archaeology is above the water table. So we've got the alignment and we've got this weird big timber platform in the middle there. Um, that bit there. Uh, and again, as you can see from that, the, the modelling of the water table seems to suggest that you know this is not this is not good long term. All sorts of problems um, as to what you can do about that. I think most recently, I'm not quite up to date with this, is talk about reflooding this part of, of, of the basin, or at least the bit that Flag Fens to try and raise the water so and keep it, you know, keep the site wet. Um, there's kind of issues with that as well. So we don't really know what the prospects for long-term preservation situ are. Again, this comes down to work on modelling and looking at the chemistry of the water and the sediment. So there is work doing that. But again, it, it's tricky enough. And whilst we're on Flag Fen, this is... Um, just literally down the road from Flag Fen is the side of Musk Farm that you may have heard of. It made the press uh, not long ago. Called, it was called Britain's, slightly inaccurately, Britain's Pompeii. Can you hear it? I missed that. And Fenland Basin. So again, we kind of, Flag Fen is sort of over, over here, kind of thing. So again, we're coming into the, into the peats. Um, and this is some years ago now, it was discovered there was more archaeology coming out of a section of this huge, um, you can see it's enormous uh, China clay. Extraction pit or a clay extraction pit, sorry, it's a McCain chip mm. factory in the background there. Um, but yeah, and it's clear there's archaeology coming out of the section, lots of lovely archaeology, like kind of bronzes and as well as organic material. Um, and this, again, cutting the story short, you can see where the archaeology is situated right on the edge of this quarry. You can, again, you can see where the water table is. So the archaeology was at threat 
long argument about what to do about it, and there's monitoring and modelling of the water table. I won't go into that. But eventually, the upshot was, was the decision was it had to be preserved by record. The pro prospects for it surviving long term were not good. Um, but again, you know, who foots the bill? In this case, it was footed by um, uh, the, essentially the owners of, of, of the land, um, and Historic England put money into it as well. But it was, wasn't cheap um, because the site itself was, it was really quite impressive, you know, enormous. And, and this, they built a kind of marquee over it here. So it's an excavation that's happening inside, partly for security, partly just, you know, to kind of keep prying eyes away. There's so much nice archaeology coming up, but you can see. So very briefly, what you've got here is this is a Bronze Age settlement that was built kind of in a river channel, and then it burned down and collapsed. So it, all the kind of houses kind of fell into the river. So it's incredible preservation, including kind of real Marie Celeste moments like this. This is a Bronze Age bowl with its contents still in it. Wow. So yeah, see so all the archaeology kind of collapsed in. So you literally got this moment in time yeah. because obviously, you know, things set on fire and everyone kind of went out, ran off, and then it, so whoever was I think one of the bowls had a spoon in it as well. It's like almost like you're eating dinner and someone goes, run, you know. And um, so again, preservation is amazing, but you can just think of the cost of this. Yeah. I think it's cost, um, I think the excavation itself, I think I'm right, it might be slightly misquoting, it's about two million quid. So it's a long going project. And that's before you even get the stuff that you have to conserve and analyze in the lab. Um, and again, it was, it was, I think it was got slightly acrimonious because there's an argument about the water table data, you know, could the site survive, could it not? all sorts of scientific debates going backwards and forwards. And there's other stuff, other archaeology well associated with this site, the log boats, beautiful bronze log boats again, and all these have to be dug and lifted. And these are all currently in actually the Black Fen being conserved. So again, you can't just leave this stuff in the ground, but again, you can imagine the cost of excavation, the cost of moving this stuff and then conserving it. Okay, so pretty much my um, final example in the UK is, is the site, is the Somerset Levels. Yeah, so Glastonbury, that area, the, um, uh, the, again, peat, this is the peatland area, the former peatland really, more accurately, of the Somerset levels. Um, and again, there's some classic uh, archaeological sites. I mentioned Sweet Track, which are a little bit more in tick. But we have this site, the Glastonbury Lake Village, which is an Iron Age um, village. And again, this, this is, has a long history of excavation going kind of right back. And what we have here is these house platforms and remarkable organic preservation of, of all sorts of artifacts and wooden artifacts associated with this Iron Age settlement that was kind of built at the edge of the wetland in the Iron Age. You can see the successive clay layers and these house platforms as a section built up. Um, there's another settlement nearby called the, the Mir settlement that's, that's not quite as well, under, as, as well understood. Um, but that's a reconstruction of the site. And it's often said, and I think this is true, that this picture, everything in this picture is it's attested by the archaeological record. So everything that's kind of in there, the, the bones of the swans, the paddles, the canoes, uh, you know, the huts, okay, a bit of imagination with that. Um, but again, this is a, a, it gives you an idea of the range of material we get in, you get in peatlands. The problem here is if we plot the archaeology, um, that's from John Coles' book, um, it's pretty clear, again, in terms of the monitoring work, that, that um, these sites are not in great nick. The, the settlement of Mir is certainly degrading. Glastonbury seems to be in slightly better condition. But a lot of these other trackway sites are associated with the Somerset levels um, only survive partially. That's partly to do with peat cutting, but it's also to do with problems with the water table. So you might ask what's going on here, but in theory, some of these sites at least are meant to be legally protected, whether that's through archaeological sketch scheduling or triple SI or Ramsar status or agreements with landowners. But you know, as you can imagine, there's all sorts of problems with this. And this, you know, it's remarkable. Kind of record is just kind of going, um, is disappearing. Um, again, this is drawn from from the project Richard Brunning that, that looked at preservation and re-excavated a bit like a flag fair, re-excavated some of these sites to to see what's going on in the ground. So that's what that data is partly based on. Is looking at that. Um, and what seems to be happening, that's the sweet track I mentioned earlier on. Um, there is a bit of the National Nature Reserve where water tables are kept uh, artificially high um, by dams and so forth. And it, it's, it seems to be the state case that the best preservation of the sweet track structure that remain is in that area where the water tables are being kept artificially high. It's unclear what the status of the site is you know, outside the nature reserve. So again, that importance obviously of a, 
high water table. This is, of course, all enormously ironic, given this is the Somerset levels, and you know, you probably remember this flooding a few years ago. And we're getting upset, you know, the reason that these areas floods is essentially they are really just big floodplains, you know. Um, not a whole power you can do about it, except possibly maybe adopt the um, that's a reconstruction of the famous reconstruction of, of the sweet track, what it looked like originally. Um, clearly, in the Neolithic period, they were um, they were not, not living in the wetlands, they were crossing them. So, anyway. That's some irony there. Okay, so just to finish off, let's just look quickly at Ireland. It's obviously got lots of bogs in Ireland, as we saw earlier, and lots of archaeology. The problem here, of course, is that the extraction of peat for commercial or for, or for domestic energy, rather, and also commercial peat extraction by board the owner. Um, and that's on an enormous scale. It obviously involves draining the bogs first before you can cut them. Um, and that's because a large amount of our energy supply comes from peat and like 38% and it's like bigger a few years ago now. I don't know what it is now, but probably about the same or going down maybe as the peatlands are worked out. Um, and we know from, uh, th there is archaeological work that's meant to take place as part of this uh, extraction of peat, but it's, it, it's at best partial. Not everything is being dug. So in terms of preservation by record, that doesn't really happen. Maybe 10% of the sites that are now and get excavated, the rest are getting destroyed. So what we do know is we visit around about 4,000 sites. This is just in the border of peatlands, which I think is about 70,000 hectares. So there's lots of sites there. And again, this is, these are ones identified through monument survey, survey, um, service funded survey. Um, but the problem with that is if we look at the status of these sites, is um, we can read off uh, most of these are, uh, are either threatened or in imminent danger or being destroyed. And this is a few years ago, probably most of them have been destroyed. But again, that's obviously through direct impact of peat cutting. But again, this is all associated with the drainage of the bogs uh, for economic purposes. Um, I'm not going not to go into that. I'll, I'll send you that link later. Um, so you might kind of say, well, what's being done about this? And the answer to that is, um, well, we can see there's some individual responses in Starcar and Flagfen and maybe uh, one or two other sites. Um, there are peatland restoration programs going on particularly got the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, Peatland Restoration Programme there, hoping to restore 1 million hectares of peatland by 2020. And essentially this means blocking drains and, and cutting down scrub and re-wetting. You can see that's Hatfield Moors where the track is, that's what's going on there. And this is within the context of peatland restoration for ecosystem services, for biodiversity, water regulation, carbon storage, all that side of thing, um, potentially. Um, in some ways, that's good for archaeology, um, but obviously, you know, that's not going to restore sites that are already degraded. It might slow down with flag fen if we re-wet the site. Hopefully, it will slow down degradation. But again, we've got the issue of water quality, which is coming in here somewhere as well. So we need to know more about that. So in the case of Hatfield Moor, the trackway, what remains of it has been kind of covered over, preserved in situ, but we don't know once it's buried up, buried in the ground whether that's working at all. Mm -hmm. We don't know whether what remains is surviving or not. And the other side of this is, and this is sometimes a problem, is the fact that as part of these peatland restoration programmes, if they're moving peat around, that can affect archaeology as well. Um, so we have to struggle from both ends sometimes, trying to convince the conservation and restoration lobby they need input from archaeologists, otherwise it's the same as peat cutting or anything else, you're ripping out bits of archaeology. Okay, so that's a kind of whip, a really quick whip through this, but hopefully it's kind of shown um, really what the problem is here, and the, the particular the, the connection between peatlands, water, preservation, of archaeological remains, and this is what, what leads people, again, Richard Brunning, I mentioned earlier, to say things like this, well-proven, extensive, and rapid description of waterlogged archaeological deposits, European peatlands should be regarded as a significant crisis. Um, and that is, is certainly the case. So anyway, I hope that's kind of shown the connection between water, organic archaeology, um, and preservation of sites. Again, it ties up to all sorts of the issues to do with peat and restoration, ecosystem services, frameworks, you know, the economic component of, of peat cutting. Uh, you know, it's kind of central to all of this, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to envisage a bright future for a lot of these sites, really, or maybe in one or two cases. So on that slightly depressing note, I'll finish. <laughs>